then uh, well normally it's me speaking now I noticed that uh, Vishal Agarwal has appeared um, yeah. right uh, so please listen to me for the next hour and then you go okay no, um, Right, because thank I mean, you, we you. had planned you at the last, just not to force you to get up too early back in uh, Minnesota. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk about uh, Ralph Roop's uh, importance for Hindu society today. So, Ralph Roop was born in Sonipat, in a business family, Agarwals also. And his father was a village banker. Moreover, he went to study in Delhi University economics. So that would really, um, both by nature and by nurture, make for a money maker. But most of his life, he was poor. Um, so, okay, I mean, that's for his practical circumstances. He never went into business. He never married, never had children. Uh, he was only active in the intellectual and spiritual sphere. He started out as a um, freedom fighter and, and not... Um, not book-wise a freedom fighter, but uh, down in the trenches, he spent some time in prison during the Quit India movement, which was a Gandhian movement to force the British to quit India in summer of 1942, which was actually predicated on the expectation that the Japanese would soon conquer India and that India was better equipped to face the Japanese when they were independent and when they, strictly speaking, satisfied the Japanese criterion of being Asian. They pretended to start the Asian co-prosperity sphere by massacring the Chinese and so on. But their propaganda was Asian co-prosperity sphere. So Indians expected that if they were independent, if they were not a dependency of Europe anymore, then they would be in a good negotiating position with the Japanese. So um, later on, he wrote a critique of this indictment that this is his very first published paper. Indictment is a very critical analysis of the Quit India movement, uh, largely condemning it. I mean, showing how it was foolish how it was badly organized, but especially badly conceived. It's the type of uh, critique that once in a while is needed. It is not just in India, this is everywhere. But, you know, in India you see it regularly that Hindu activists do things that they're proud of, that they beat their chest over, but that in fact are counterproductive. Like the Quit India movement, by neutralizing the Congress leadership, left the field free for the Muslim League, uh, which was then better capable of preparing for the partition. Um, okay, so uh, he was a Gandhian activist, as was Sitaram Goel also. Um, during the war, he worked for an American organization that had set up an office in Delhi in the context of the uh, Second World War. Then uh, after that, he remained in the Gandhian movement. When Gandhi was killed, he was a secretary of Madeleine Slade, better known as Mira Behen, who was a close confidant of uh, Gandhi in his last years. She wanted to uh, order and edit her correspondence with him, but uh, this was never finished. Then um, 
in a few years time, the, the public opinion in India had sharply drifted to the left. In fact, it is at that time that he founded a little debating society, the Changers Club. The Changers Club was predicated on the, um, Gan uh, the Marxist notion that the philosophers have always interpreted the world but never changed it. So here it was a club promising to change the world. What they did, of course, was only interpret the world. It was a talking shop, but nevertheless, it was interesting. And so it comprehended, it, it contained a number of people that would become important later on in their own uh, right, uh, like uh, Elsie Jain, like Girilal Jain, um, and then Sitaram Gowell, of course. Uh, in wider circles, he also was familiar with the recently deceased Kapila Vatsyayana. Um, I mentioned it because I had asked her if I could interview her precisely for this. I understood she was too ill already to actually uh, present anything here. Uh, but even for that, she felt too ill, but she promised to contact me again when she would be better, but unfortunately, that never happened. Uh, anyway, uh, so all these uh, old uh, witnesses have died in the meantime. Um, but the Changers Club, when it existed, was interesting. And um, so the first publication of the Changers Club was this indictment about the Quitinia movement. The second one was about Mahatma Gandhi's murder. And there um, he took a rather original and rather unique uh, position. His, uh, his position was that, uh, of course, not to, um, not to justify the murder, not to overly seriously condemn it. You know, he took an understanding position, namely that, on the one hand, it was a sign of life for Hindu society that it had reacted in some way. Now, this was not the best way, but at least if Hindu society had completely taken it lying down, that their great leader had collaborated a bit with the partition, had given into it, had not fought against it. He had promised the common Hindu that he would prevent partition, that he would stake his life for it. And he had staked his life 16, 17 times, fasting unto death. On this occasion, he refused to do that. So it's understandable that there was an anger against him in Hindu society. And yes, at some point, it had found utterance through the gun of uh, Naturam Godse. On the other hand, he also found it a sign of greatness of Mahatma Gandhi, because whatever you think about his politics, he was an important person. He was a great man, even in, in, in strictly Hindu terms. You see his, uh, his appeal to tyaj, to, uh, to renunciation, to, um, uh, to asceticism, resonated very much with the Hindu people. And so it is commensurate with his greatness that he didn't die in his bed. At least that was uh, Ram Swarup's uh, observation at that time. Then uh, he was moving to the left along with uh, all the intellectuals at that time. What um, made him think again was the pro-partition stand of the Communist Party of India, where they were very unprincipled and where they thought purely in terms of power, not even of their own goals of uh, the new communist man or something like that. No, they were making common cause with the most obscurantist forces. And um, what they were doing was obviously not um, 
in the communist line of thinking because the partition was a good thing, a boon for the rich Muslims, but not for the poor Muslims, many of whom were left behind in India in places where they were no longer at home or went to Pakistan, but without anything to start a new life. So it was strange that the, the CPI was in favor of this partition. And in fact, this, their favoring partition was part of a larger plan of fragmenting India, of balkanizing India. So this was to a normal Indian citizen. You don't have to be particularly nationalist or Hindu or anything. For any normal India, this was repulsive. And so he became a very committed anti-communist then uh, just at that time and for the same um for the same reasons of uh of concern the other one of course was what was happening in china at the time where china was being overrun by the chinese communist party so for that reason sardar patel the home minister set up a think tank for studying communism that was the Democratic Research Service. And meanwhile, his friend um, Sitaram Goel had still a certain belief in communism. He wanted to join the Communist Party that failed at the last moment, precisely because just then, the uh, Sardar Patel, the Home Ministry, was uh, cracking down on the Communist Party. So they told Goel, wait a few days, you know, until this has settled down. But that never came. Instead, um, Ram Sarup convinced Sitaram Goel about the evil of communism. And so it is in Calcutta that then um, Sitaram Goel set up his own think tank, the Society for the Defense of Freedom in Asia. Then, um, certain human things happened, namely there was this uh, conflict with Minu Masani, who was the effective leader of the anti-communist activities in India. Minu Masani also came to lead the Swatantra party, which was a pro-Western anti-communist party. Um, with that, uh, later on, Sitaram Gov built, built bridges and ultimately became a candidate. But um, Ram Sarup stayed away from Minu Masani. Then the, um, in 1956, the mass conversion of the Mahar caste to Buddhism happened. And so this was a a new phenomenon, people stepping out from Hinduism, but not to join Islam or Christianity, but to re-embrace a very Indian tradition, namely Buddhism, thinking that somehow this way they were making a fist against Hinduism, against Brahminism. So about that, Ram Sarup started uh, writing a totally different work, namely Hinduism and Buddhism, where he showed that precisely um, going over to Buddhism was not at all an apostasy from Hinduism, if that concept makes sense, that it was simply the embracing of one of the many sampradayas within Hinduism. He will um, do similar work regarding the separatism within Sikhism and within the uh, Ramakrishna mission later on. Uh, when the worst of the Cold War was over, the anti-communist struggle lost steam, he started taking an interest in sadhana ever more seriously, practicing meditation and living on his own. And gradually he started writing articles on religious topics 
for uh, different newspapers, uh, including the Observer of Business and Politics, the Hindustan Times, and also the Organizer. Now this I want to emphasize because an, an important topic here for um, India watchers and Indologists and so on uh, would be in this case, and maybe some of them are present uh, uh, listening in. Well, for them, um, I have to explain the uh, particular uh, relation between Ram Swarup and Sitaram Goel on the one hand, and the RSS, of which the organizer is uh, the uh, paper. So the organizer followed the line uh, laid down by the RSS. So if you publish in the organizer, it might mean you are in with them. Now, as uh, Aris Chandra said earlier, this is a point on which uh, Ram Swarup and Sita Ram Goel didn't see eye to eye. Uh, Sita Ram Goel was quite blunt in his criticism of the RSS, though mostly only privately. There's not much of it in writing. There's one place where he writes that most organizations come at a point somewhere in their history when they do not serve their original purpose anymore, where they are only subsisting because they happen to exist, where they are only serving themselves. So he said that this is what has happened to the RSS. Now, I can't even say whether Ram Sarup shared any of it because he absolutely avoided the subject. Uh, he would implicitly admit that there was something wrong with the RSS sometimes, but then he would say, well, yeah, but still they're the best we have. Like he made the comparison to the Bangladesh war when Hindus didn't have any pro-Hindu party at their disposal, there was only Congress in power, there was Indira. But okay, you see, Indira did the job. She was not a great Hindu, but she did the job. She split Pakistan, she liberated Bangladesh, and she allowed the um, Bangladeshi Hindus to survive. They had come as refugees to India, now they could go back thinking that henceforth Bangladesh would be a secular state, which it was for the first three years, but then it reverted to being an Islamic state, as you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, this shows the principle that, okay, you can't always have the best material, but if it does the job, that is most important. So the RSS at the time was what Hindus had and they achieved certain things. Like for example, they, um, they led the uh, Ayodhya movement. Though there you can discuss uh, whether the RSS was necessary at all, who knows. There was a certain pressure necessary but then probably Rajiv Gandhi in the Congress party, as it was at that time, still largely a Hindu party, would have taken it up and, and the temple would have been built just as well. Um, but other things are really, uh, we really have to thank the RSS and, and its uh, political party for that, such as the normalization of the situation in, uh, Kashmir. That was something that surprised us all. It would have surprised Ram Sarup too. And so that is, that is one of the things that the RSS is to be thanked for. So they are valid. Nevertheless, um, Ram Sarup also differed from them in opinion. He didn't quarrel with them about this difference, but nevertheless, silently, he did see things differently. Uh, like, um, 
for instance, the question of communism. In, um, already in the 50s, the Sang was somewhat anti-communist, but not seriously so, in the sense that uh, they were against both America and, and the Soviet Union. And they saw communism as a threat in national terms. They said, communism is against the Indian ethos whatever that may be. I mean, Indian ethos, in my opinion, is a weasel word for Hinduism. But then that's not really the reason because communism is not in line with the Russian ethos either or the Chinese ethos. So the critique of communism is of a universal nature. It's against humanity. Is against who people are, what they want to do, what they aspire to in life. Communism is in many respects stifling at best. So there uh, already uh, Ram Sarup differed seriously with the nationalist outlook uh, of the RSS, which has only increased uh, since then. At that time, they called themselves Hindu nationalists. Today, this word Hindu is uh, kept in the background. They emphasize nationalism. And they sometimes also boast how secular they are, how they do more appeasement to Muslims than even Congress can do, and so on. So there, the national outlook is very strong, which Ram Sarup never went with. But he also didn't bother criticizing. That's a job for people like me. Um, but so Ram Swarup was always quiet, diplomatic. And um, so sometimes he said things very sharply, but never hurting, never uh, seeking conflict. But so for the benefit of the um, India watchers over here, the Wikipedia writers and so on, um, I have to say that Wikipedia is very wrong in claiming. I've just verified it. Uh, they do write that Voice of India is essentially an RSS outfit meant for uh, uh, spreading the RSS ideology. Now that is plainly untrue. I mean, within, within Hinduism, but even within Hindu politics, you know, this is a house with many chambers. There are a number of different currents. And so the Ram Sarup current was quite distinct from the Hindu Twa current. One thing Ram Sarup has, for instance, written is that um, one should not be against what is foreign, uh, like in the Ayodhya affair, for instance, the RSS used to say that Babar was a foreign invader and Rama was an Indian hero. Now that has nothing to do with it if you consider it properly, because the Greeks, the Huns, the Kushanas, many people entered India and didn't destroy temples. The British, entered India and didn't destroy temples. They were very destructive to many aspects of Indian life, but they didn't destroy temples. They didn't forbid Hinduism. Uh, so it's not because of being foreign, it's because of being Muslim that Babar did what he did. So according to Ram Sarup, one should not be against what is foreign, only against what is foreign to Atman. That's how he formulated it. And so the Indian national perspective has its value at a certain level. It should not be, should not be neglected, should not be despised. The way that the people like I heard George Soros mentioned here before, um, George Soros and other globalists uh, want to destroy nationhood. That is, of course, not necessary. Nationhood is a natural phenomenon, but only that. 
it should not be the object of, the, of an ideology. You see, national identity is there, but it is just there. It's not something you should want or you should not want. It's just there. It's just a natural phenomenon. And so you should look upwards. You should look to Atman. Then um, he moved away to uh, the subject of religion, as I said. And in that he focused mainly on three, three aspects. One is the unity of the different sampradayas. He, um, first, you know, got to know of this problem in the case of Buddhism and Neo-Buddhism, where he shows that uh, Buddhism is simply one uh, school within Hinduism, uh, which has a specific relation to the Vedas, or some schools like uh, Shaktism, you could say, well, this existed already tens of thousands of years. This is the natural village religion. Uh, this doesn't take any sophistication, any uh, Vedic culture with its uh, science of grammar, science of astronomy, of mathematics, and so on. This is just natural religion. Well, the Buddha was far more specifically inside the Vedic stream. And you could uh, explain much of his teaching as a revitalization, a resourcing, going back to the source of the Vedas. He does um, diplomatically still use the terms Hinduism and Buddhism. I mean the term Hinduism and Buddhism, juxtaposing the two. Uh, when in a radical mood, I would say I wouldn't do that because strictly speaking, Buddhism is a part of Hinduism. When it didn't exist yet, there was already Hinduism. And then within Hinduism, you see Jainism coming up, you see Buddhism coming up, uh, later on, you see Sikhism coming up, you see the Rama Krishna mission coming up, the Veera Shaivas coming up. And so they all are within the big tent of Hinduism. Hinduism simply means an Indian pagan, any Indian pagan, whether Vedic or not. About uh, the problem case of Sikhism, we're going to hear more from uh, Vishal Agarwal. I would like to focus on the, um, the third case of the Ramakrishna mission. You see, Ram Sarup, having lived in uh, Calcutta, was quite familiar uh, with the uh, Ramakrishna mission and studied it also. And so when he heard that the Ramakrishna Mission tried to get registered as a non-Hindu minority. Of course, he um, saw that this was not correct. Uh, before that, uh, the Sri Aurobindo Society in Pondicherry had already tried to um, get recognized as a, as a religion in its own right. This failed, uh, thanks to, among others, Michel Danino, whom you might know, uh, who showed, and it was very easy to show in court, that Sri Aurobindo had never intended to set up a separate religion, that he was very much a Hindu, or as he at that time still called it, an Arya. Now the same thing counts for the Ramakrishna mission, founded by Swami uh, Vivekananda, who had made it totally clear that he was a Hindu. In fact, that against the downheartedness of Hindus in the colonial period, he wanted Hindus to be proud of their religion. Gara se kahoham Hindu ha. So to paint him as a founder of 
another religion as an apostate from Hinduism really makes no sense. The, um, the case was lost for, for the same reason as with the Sri Aurobindo Society. Uh, the court saw through it. And so very many Hindus sympathize with the plight of the Ramakrishna mission that had made them do this. Namely that their schools could be nationalized uh, on a whim of the state government of West Bengal. So they were afraid and they wanted their schools to be protected by the protections that in, in India under the constitution, the minorities enjoy, but not the Hindus. Namely the autonomy of schools uh, is guaranteed for Christians, for Muslims, and not for Hindus. And so the Ramakrishna mission did not appeal to Hindu society, did not seek help from the Hindu parties and so on. No, it took the easy way out by leaving the sinking ship of Hinduism and, and becoming a religion in its own right. Now, they lost the case. And uh, I remember the uh, American Hindu publication, Hinduism Today, which is run by Western monks who have converted to Shaivism, that that um, headline, Ramakrishna Mission wins. They lost their court case, all right, but they won. They won their Hindu identity. They won back their natural Hindu roots. It was a very correct way of describing it. But Ram Swarup warned, you see, it's not just a matter of a court case, winning and losing. It's a matter of a mentality that you develop. So for some years now, the Ramakrishna mission has been telling itself and others that it is not Hindu. It has tried to find fault with Hinduism. It has used anti-Hindu language in order to justify its own apostasy from Hinduism. So that has gone into the mentality. And essentially, that's not too different from what has happened in Hindu society at large. You see, Hinduism has acquired a bad name. It was not always so. Of course, in the, in the days of the missionaries, uh, in the colonial days, there were already negative paintings of Hinduism, particularly about Sati and other, um, well, uh, objectionable practices. Uh, but at the same time, there was also much going for Hinduism and particularly in mysticism Many Western authors discovered Hinduism, were enthusiastic about it. Schopenhauer, Romain Roland, uh, Mark Twain, and so on and so on. And then in the 60s, 70s, you still had a big outburst of enthusiasm for Hindu gurus in the West. Um, so that was there. And many Hindus who don't follow it too closely might even think that it is still there and it's not really gone, but at the same time, the people who used to not be interested, who used to not care about India or Hinduism, have now developed a pretty palpable hostility towards Hinduism. You see in, in Western media, you see this all the time. In India, of course, you also see it, but that's because of the Indian secularists. They are not imitating the West, you see, they have their own reasons to hate Hinduism. And so many Hindus try to, well, take a distance from Hinduism. They openly mock it, you know, in the uh, English language intelligentsia or in Bollywood, they openly mock it. Or you see, even if they're still pro-Hindu, they're a bit more subdued about it. This latter mentality is what you see in the BJP. Many, and unfortunately not even all, but many of them are still committed Hindus, but still they have absorbed 
certain secularist presuppositions, like that Hindus owe something to us. You see, when you mention the discriminations against Hindus in education and in temple management, you actually find many Hindus who, just like whites in America, start to justify uh, their own uh, subjugation, the, the discrimination against themselves. Because very many Hindus are interiorizing the um, uh, the the, the poo-pooing of Hinduism, the, the dismissal of Hinduism as just something primitive, superstitious, and so on. This is gaining ground steadily, and in education, uh, nothing is done against it. You see, Hindus don't learn Hinduism properly anymore. Less and less in the home, but. In their lives, of course, schools are far more important now than they were in the Middle Ages. And so where they should have received cultural, historical education about Hindu civilization, there is nothing. There is a vacuum, except for some idealization of Christian or Muslim role models. So Hindus get alienated from Hinduism and as the Dutch proverb says, unknown makes unloved. So Hindus care less and less about Hinduism. I wonder if the, the um, Ayodhya movement on the ground, the Kaar Sevaks, the, uh, the Bajrang Dal, that was so prominent 30 years ago, if that would even still be possible today. I'm not very sure. Anyway. And so Ram Swarup warns against this, uh, this slide of um, increasing anti-Hinduism or downplaying of, uh, of Hinduism. So the same story could be told later about the, uh, the Jains who become a separate religion, the uh, Vira Shaivas that have been recognized as a separate religion. So this is all part of a larger um, alienation from Hinduism. The answer to that, I will give it in passing. This is something I discussed with Ram Sarup. I can't recall where he addressed it in writing. Um, but the answer to this is to point out, to make people aware of the greatness of Hinduism. You see, Hindus have achieved a lot of spirituality, uh, as they always say, uh, yoga practices. But that is, that is something that everybody knows, and many materialist people don't take this seriously. For them, it only proves that Hinduism is indeed otherworldly and superstitious. Um, but they have also done great things in science, in astronomy, in mathematics, they have created the science of linguistics. They have created enormous amounts of beautiful arts. So those are things to be proud of. And so if people become aware of this again, then you will see the Sikhs, for example, who now say that they're not Hindus, they will start, I am a Hindu. No, I am the best Hindu. So this is something that can be achieved, you see, it's a change in mentality that can gradually be achieved. And in fact, that this organization is a little uh, instrument in achieving. Then um, a second um, aspect of religion that uh, Ram Sarup discussed is the defense against predatory religions. Islam and Christianity are, as you know, intolerant. They have a huge record of religious persecution, not only against other religions, sometimes also, well, and of course against one another, but even inside, like the, the Sunnis in Pakistan persecuting the Ahmadiyyas and so on. 
Um, but so they have this religion of intolerance. And once they have an internal quarrel, much sooner than elsewhere, it develops into violence. This intolerance is not just a fact. That fact had been very, very sparsely documented already. Um, in thousand years of Islamic aggression against Hinduism, there is no record of any Hindu study of Islam, any Hindu critique of Islam, any polemic against Islam. There is fighting against Muslims, yes, but there is no critique of the ideology that made them do it. It seems somehow that Hindus never ask themselves, but why is this happening? Why is the Kashi Vishwanath being destroyed? Until the um, Satyartha Prakash by Swami Dayanand Saraswati about 1875, in which one chapter deals with Islam and still rather primitive, uh, rather undeveloped, is a critique of um, the Quran as such. Uh, where, of course, you can find plenty of intolerance, that is true. Uh, to go then to the Hadith was at the time still a bit much for Hindus, they didn't go that far. And then in Islamic history, for that, of course, you have to know history. But a number of uh, facts were well known, like the destruction of these famous temples. Uh, but still, uh, it was difficult at the time to broke this subject. And so a few years, a few decades later, you had Pandit Lekram, also of the Arya Samaj, that Diana had founded, who wrote a book really polemicizing against Islam. Now for his troubles, he was rewarded with being murdered. And this would happen several times over. In the next decades, several writers took up the task of studying Islam and were murdered. And so the most famous, the most consequential case was with Swami Shraddhananda, uh, who wrote a very important book, Savior of the Dying Race, uh, Hindu Sanghatan, uh, which was a very important inspiration for the Hindu Mahasabha, which he co-founded and for the RSS. But he was murdered in 1926. And it is on that occasion that the British then enacted the famous um, article uh, 295A of the Indian Penal Code, uh, which restricts people from criticizing religions or supposedly insulting religions. But any criticism can, of course, be taken to court as insulting. And so that was the British way of protecting Islam. At that time, they had developed a good relation with Islam, much less with Hinduism. And so they protected Islam from criticism. At that time, mainly from Arya Samaj criticism. It is only much later that first the Christians and finally the Hindus also saw the possibilities of this article and also started using it uh, to thwart criticism. And lastly, it was the case of uh, Wendy Doniger's book about Hinduism that was uh, not really pr uh, prosecuted in law, but that was threatened with pro prosecution in law, and therefore the book was pulped which was a to totally anachronistic measure because books are on the internet nowadays. Uh, but anyway, that, that way Hindus showed that they too could do it. Maybe that is the, the good side of it. I don't like book banning. Neither did Ram Swarup. In fact, he himself was the object or the, the target of a book ban, um, namely when he had written against Islam against uh, the, uh, uh, the hadith of Muslim, al-Muslim, uh, which is the stories from the life of the prophet. So 
So he has commented that and shown how here and there it is, uh, to say it in modern terms, against human rights. Um, so then uh, temporarily Voice of India was persecuted. They managed to find an understanding, scrapping a few lines. But so that history of uh, book banning or censorship and so on, uh, that was triggered by the murders of these very few Islam critics at the time. So then um, the Arya Samaj went silent, especially after independence when secularism came into vogue. Somehow Indians thought or Hindus thought that it was no longer done to criticize other religions. And I have to admit that it's not in the nature of Hindus to criticize other religions. When you see in history, uh, when Christianity settled, for example, no questions were asked of them. When the Parsis settled similarly, they were given freedom to practice their religion and whether that religion contained any danger to the others was not asked. I mean, if, if it would present a danger and really get aggressive, then Hindus would deal with it. But they didn't care about the ideology behind it. So, okay, these religions are intolerant, they have a terrible record and so on. However, there's something else. They are mistaken. And so Ram Swarup shows in his very diplomatic way that if studied from the Hindu science of consciousness, these religions, these theologies, leave a lot to be desired. They are, they represent lower levels of consciousness and they are not purified. They have very serious impurities, namely ego. Muhammad makes Allah work for himself. He, he himself is at the center of his worldview. Up there is Allah. But you see, as the Muslim proverb says, you can make jokes about Allah, but be careful with Muhammad. And so what speaks through Muhammad's claims is a lot of ego. He considers himself the center of the world. Ran Sarup largely avoided the psychopathological approach. You see, Hindu psychology is far, far richer than Western psychology, which grew up in a therapeutic context. So they study disease. They don't study states of consciousness in their own right. You see, their application is mostly to the field of disease, of mental disease. So he didn't take it up where uh, Swami Vivekananda had left it off. Swami Vivekananda had said that uh, practicing yoga, practicing concentration can lead to mental powers and to great uh, mental phenomena. But um, these can do a lot of harm. These can do a lot of harm to the person himself and especially to the others. Because you see somebody who is obsessed with some idea like who is obsessed that he himself is the final spokesman of God. They tend to be fascinating to people around them and to get a following. And here, the modern generation should not look too much down on the past because even today, just about any sect can get a following. And so Vivekananda approached it from this angle. He sometimes writes favorably about Islam, sometimes not. But so he gives that hint. Uh, some Western psychologists later have taken it up in right earnest, but also Sitaram Goel in the um, preface to his book, The Calcutta Quran Petition. He gives a very detailed analysis of what is wrong mentally with the prophet. 
So in the case of, uh, <coughs> of Ram Swarup, that's not so much the case. You see, he simply analyzes it in terms of the different levels of consciousness known in yoga, to what extent Islam reaches a certain level, fails to reach another level, but claims to have reached it, and so on. Uh, so this is unique. Worldwide, this is unique. Nobody else has done it. Uh, it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Ram Sarus' most important claim to fame. And meanwhile, he uh, is being subtle. He attacks very specific things in Islam, in Christianity. Uh, not on the whole, the fact that they are religions. You see, if people want to go to Mecca, that's fine. If you want to go to uh, a Hindu place of pilgrimage, it's essentially the same. It does the same kind of thing to you. So it is spiritually uplifting to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. Why not? Or to practice fasting, as Islam does, just as Judaism does, just as Christianity does, just as Hinduism does. Um, so the fact that it's a religion with religious practices, that is not the problem. Many Western atheists will laugh at everything that smells like religion. And they don't see the very important differences between religions. So Ram Sarup is very judicious in, in approaching Islam and criticizing it on the points that need to be criticized. He also, in fact, criticizes the upcoming religion today, which is hedonism. But that, of course, is a, a target of criticism of Hinduism since thousands of years. Then a third aspect, and with that I will wind up, a third aspect of religion uh, where he is active is the outreach to pagans. In his book, uh, Names of Gods, he calls on the populations of the rest of the world, especially those who have been Christianized or Islamized, to go on a pilgrimage to their own past, to, to get to know, the, to, to acquaint themselves with the gods of their ancestors. Some peoples uh, still retain their ancestral religions. Most have lost them, are rediscovering them, or are in a position where they can rediscover them. Like, for instance, at that time, it was not there yet. Today, there is a so-called neo-paganism among the Arabs, which they call Vatania, uh, of the fatherland, national. So they, they do rediscover their own um, pre-Islamic religion. Of course, if in an Islamic surrounding, they have to do it very discreetly, but it is happening. And so in Europe, I can testify that it's already quite a movement and getting better and better in quality. You see, when it started, it was all very funny and it did it, it, uh, Halloween stuff, witches and so on. Right now it's a lot more mature. It has far better knowledge of its own uh, religious scriptures and so on. Uh, to this, many Hindus react, oh, but you see, we are not pagans. Hinduism is not pagan. Well, I would say, who do you think you are? You see, you cannot decide whether you are a pagan. Pagan is a Christian concept and then secondarily also a Muslim concept, where they call it kafir. And they decide who is pagan, namely everyone who is not Christian, respectively who is not Muslim. So paganism does not answer to the stereotype that Christians have created of it, like paganism means primitive, means uh, walking around like cavemen and, uh, you know, blood and, dirt and, and so on. Uh, that's not pagan. From a Christian viewpoint, the most subtle, the most impressive thinkers outside Christianity are pagan. Like Socrates was pagan, Confucius was pagan, the Buddha was pagan. They are all burning in hell right now, according to Christianity. So you are pagan. 
And yes, it is very appropriate, very right, and also very useful to you to build bridges with the old remaining pagans in countries like uh, Guatemala or New Zealand or so. Some of the indigenous uh, people still retain their religion. Or the neo-pagans, those who have rediscovered their ancestors' religion, like in Lithuania, in Scandinavia, and so on. This is going on. And so Hindus are right to build bridges with them. Only you could say that Hinduism is the elder brother. It knows more. It is far more advanced. You see, the others have a pantheon of gods too. And these gods are superficially the same as Indra, as Agni, and so on. But um, yeah, you could reasonably say, you know, Hinduism should look a little bit down on them because it has advanced farther in terms of consciousness, it has developed farther. But all right, um, you can be aware of what you have gained that the others have lost or have forgotten about or have never had, but have a possibility to obtain. There is one um, practical application of this. And so even though Ram Sarup was a bit of a, an ivory tower scholar, nevertheless, he has already had practical effect. There is a society called the Gathering of the Elders, which was set up by an American Hindu, an Indian-born American Hindu, Yashwan Patak, who is a professor of, I think, pharmacy in an American university. And American Hindus are in a very good position to start this because of course they have the Hindu background. At the same time in America, they get to know Native Americans, uh, some African immigrants and so on, or some uh, white American neo-pagans who all have something to do with pagan religion and who are galvanized by the prospect of having a certain global unity or at least a global common platform at the same time in very practical terms american hindus also have the money to set this up you know in, in india it would be more difficult and in guatemala and so on it would also be difficult so anyway they have set this up uh, there have been local meetings between hindus and for example the druids in england there is in England a neo-Druid movement. And um, so they get together, like every year they have a festival of Druid Hindu um, uh, friendship. And um, so similarly in all parts of the world, and then every three years, there is a gathering in one city and particularly at the request of all these foreign participants themselves, it is always in an Indian city. So it has been Haridwar in Ujjain, in Mumbai. And so um, I think normally, normally, if things go back to normal, it should be next February, but maybe that will have to be postponed for a year. But anyway, um, this, uh, appreciation of Hinduism as, as the, the, the leader, as the locomotive of these pagans reviving, that is very much happening. And that is a movement which we really should support, uh, if only to honor the uh, contribution to this movement by Sri Ram Swarup. Thank you. Any uh, questions or objections or so? I have a question, uh, Conrad. Okay. So I want to ask you, I mean, uh, these other pagan uh, religions, if any of them have uh, texts, um, do they also have something equivalent of uh, Sadvipraha Bahudavadanti, like we have in the Veda? 
where you know it talks about 33 or more gods but at the uh, devatas at the same time it says sadvi prabhata vadanti in the pagan religions that you are talking about do they have any texts yes. which say that well some do and some don't uh, of course and you know, of some very little has been preserved uh, but so that is often there yes and so in in greece ancient greece it was there very explicitly but then in the case of greece you can wonder is if this is not under indian influence you see the relation between greece and india is complicated in the sense that you have a lot of transmission uh, in the classical period from india to greece far more than you think i mean if you only study greece here and there you find india along with egypt being mentioned in a laudatory way um, but even more than what you get to see there there is an indian influence on greece both in science and in spirituality um on the other hand greece has a common history with with hinduism thousands of years earlier and so you do find some elements of this surviving in classical greece uh, there is a oxford scholar uh, nick allen who has shown that a number of motifs present in the mahabharata are also present in homer in the iliad and the odyssey so he shows you see this is clearly from a common background of storytelling but that was there already when the greeks as well as the germans the romans and so on they were all still sitting back in their homeland which i say is india um and so these traditions including notions of yoga go back that far like you know i mean i know in the west many people are discussing about when did yoga start and they say oh it started with the buddha or so you know as long as they don't have to admit that hindus had anything to do with it you know it can be that old but not much older well in reality it is certainly 6000 years old and so you find remains you see hints at yoga in both germanic and greek mythology and that's another subject so i won't go into that but so you find traces of what is now known as hindu buddhist spirituality that is now being borrowed from the from the orient uh you find traces of that in the native traditions only not understood very well you know not known very well so in practice all these people have no option but to go borrow it in the east and so you do find at the moment i see it everywhere in these neo pagan circles uh a sort of amalgamation between ancestral tradition and what they can borrow from india i also want to make a comment about uh, arya samaj you know in the context yes. of uh, sectarianism mm-hmm. and separatism um dayananda saraswati's opposition to pauranik uh, you know sectar you know was about the sectarianism you know he he thought of sanatan dharma as a universal you know um uh, and not uh, you know sectarian uh, you know and then he was fighting against uh, the development of sectarianism but eventually it actually became a sect uh you know yeah. it, that's where it uh, led to eventually anyway <laughs> yeah it happens all the time it's reminiscent of what happens in protestantism where you know you have a in in holland you have a church now together underway that's what it's called it's meant to be a reunification of a number of sects and in practice all these sects have split into two with those who reunify and those who remain true to themselves and so yeah i mean this is a human phenomenon you know you can only transcend that by deepening your knowledge and seeing that what the arya samaj is all about is what sanatana dharma is all about that ultimately is the same thing in the case of the arya samaj indeed i think that the separatism well is is over the worst you know that this coming all right um we will have a harder not to crack in the case of the nanak pant about which uh, vishal is going to talk right now in fact if there are no more questions i will give the floor to him now 
I just want to make a comment uh, about, yeah. I'm very happy to note that, uh, about this paganism and the outreach. Uh, my own experience has been that uh, uh, last year we announced a conference on uh, Indic and pagan environmentalism. And uh, I received a pretty strong uh, pushback uh, amongst uh, uh, several uh, Hindu intellectuals and uh, it was uh, fairly disheartening. Uh, later on, we did the conference as a center for indigenous uh, environmentalism, but uh, it, definitely the outreach uh, uh, to uh, to the global pagan world, neo pagan world, has to be there. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I don't you know, like you said, we can be the elder brother if we want. If we have the ego, we have the super ego. We always have carry the super ego. All the intellectuals yeah. uh, who are there. Uh, trying to protect our dharma, have an extraordinary ego. So we might have an ego, but uh, we must know what the global trends are. The global trends are on environmentalism, sustainability. And if we don't understand these things and, and, and the shift towards uh, polytheistic framework, we have to do an outreach. And, and uh, we yeah. don't have a choice there. Uh, uh, I just want to make okay. a comment. Last one. Yeah, may I? Yes, of course. Okay, very quickly, uh, uh, one brief comment about uh, your uh, description of Indira Gandhi as, as uh, this person who actually delivered um, a certain Hindu yeah. agenda. I, and, and you referred to Bangladesh. I would say, it, with hindsight, we can say that the creation of Bangladesh turned out to be a disaster for India because so long as Bangladeshis were fighting Pakistan, they were bleeding mm -hmm. Pakistan to death. And after the Indian army went and created or helped uh, them create Bangladesh, um, now we have um, enemies, so to speak, on both sides, except so long as we have a good prime minister there, Sheikh Hasina, she keeps things under somewhat better control, but otherwise the decimation of Hindus has continued unstopped, I mean, unchallenged. Secondly, mm -hmm. uh, we were never allowed to know that the massacre, or the genocide of Bangladeshis that took place actually was primarily aimed at Hindu Bangladeshis, mm -hmm. that there were 90% of those slaughtered, raped, and that's what I'm told, um, were Hindus. They, they were the prime targets. And this was something that even Indira regime did not want to acknowledge, did not want anyone in India to know, because they think it will um, instigate communal passions within uh, India. That's why terrorism has no religion and all that spiel mm -hmm. that we face. Now, as far as uh, connecting with pagans, I, I fully agree with you on the need to do so, absolutely. But, uh, I, you know, as, as you said, just as Hindus have never seriously studied Islam, and that includes people like me, um, similarly, we, we've we lost the urge to know others. Uh, we don't even look at the Thai people as our own. We don't look at the entire Eastern, uh, you know, Singapore, yes, we feel comfortable in because there are a lot of little Indias there. But other than that, I don't know what has killed this urge to know and own those who are our own as our own. We're so busy, Hindu, Muslim, bhai bhai. Um, they, they will never be your bhai bhai. But those who really are not apart, not separate and want to be your close to you, we don't pay attention to. And finally, this business of pagan, c connecting with pagan people. You know, in a way, we have a, have a dual, triple disadvantage uh, because the pagans in, say, Europe, those who are discovering their pagan roots, uh, they often sound so childish, childlike, childish, because there isn't that rich a legacy to hold on to. Uh, Hindus are lucky because we have so such a rich written tradition. So we can't bodlerize it beyond a point. 
mm. uh, they are at a disadvantage. So it's not just that um, the discourse becomes unequal, but it begins to be resented. For example, take the Green Party of Germany. When they started on their environmental binge, uh, they would not even condescend to pay tribute to a Gandhi, uh, except mm. in the passing. I mean, he, he was never acknowledged as an important influence on um, many of the issues that they were talking about. Um, so there is that resistance, just as yoga shouldn't be seen as Hindu. No, nothing really good should be seen as Hindu. Mm -hmm. Stop at Buddhism if possible, um, but certainly not go that far. So uh, it's a, you know, it has to be apart from what Hari Kiranji did. And I think that was really remarkable. I'm sorry I missed it for whatever reason, but I think you can't, Hariji, you can't afford to stop it, but at some level, it has to become part of our foreign policy mandate. Um, but then the government is so insensitive to anything cultural, to anything civilizational, uh, unless this is taken, I mean, ICCR should be one of the prime institutions, which builds these links for us. Um, but in the meantime, Hari Kiranji, it's your job. Please don't give up. We count on you to do all the things that the government right now refuses to do. Thank you. Thank you. Right. This is my hearty there, agreement. There all is right. a comment that Chaugleji just sent me. He was saying that the World Council of Ethnic Religions is actually a Sangh Parivar project. He just yeah, yeah. Okay. Didn't I say that? Well, okay. I'll gladly, gladly explicitate it. So this Yashwan Pathak. Uh, is an RSS Pracharak. It's in that capacity, in fact, that I met him when I visited one um, uh, Sangha gathering over there. And um, uh, especially because it's Ashok Chagule, with whom I've had this debate about the quality of the RSS since 25 years. Um, okay. Uh, the um, the Sangh Parivar gathers a lot of good people right? Uh, certainly. And many of them separately take interesting initiatives. And so one I really admire uh, is uh, Yasun Patak. However, for some reason, and I don't know exactly why it happens, but as they climb up, and maybe not all of them are interested in climbing up, but those who do climb up somehow lose that Hindu quality. Um, I mean, when I hear the discourses of Mohan Bhagwat about every Indian is a Hindu, that is to say, Asaduddin Uwaisi is a Hindu, um, it's so nonsensical. I mean, the, the intellectual level is so childish, you can't, you can't sell that to anyone. I mean, only Hindus will buy it. Uh, you know, that's so sad. And, um, like in the Ayodhya movement, of course, the, the example I gave of Babar being a foreigner, you know, no, he was a Muslim. So the fact that you misconstrue the issues and try to avoid criticizing Islam. Now, that's not what I see among common RSS men who I visit or when I stay at one of their, their house or so. Um, but it's the language we get from the high ups in the RSS. So. I, I, I don't immediately have a solution for that, but that is a problem. And so with that problem, Ram Sarup and Sita Ram Goel dealt with in different ways, but they did recognize both that there is something, something problematic there. That's worth a conference in its own right. 